to the entire world. That means the entire church has a ministry. So I'm going to ask you again, how is your ministry going? I hear silence. That could be either, you know, you're so confident you don't want to say anything, or I don't know. We're going to dive into the story of three evangelists today. Peter, Judas, and John. But before we do, let's pause for prayer. Good morning, Father. Thanks so much for the Sabbath. Thanks that we get the chance to, once a week, stop what we're doing and focus on you. I know we're focusing on you the rest of the week, but just a special day to come even closer. As we open your word, please once again, use your words, not mine. We want to see what you have to say. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. A quick plug before we start. Um, there are some younger people here. In two weeks, we're going to be starting Pathfinders. So there'll be a sign-up sheet next week. Uh, we had the nice story about starting fires and how they needed a match. If you want to learn how to start fires without matches, this is where you're going to do it, right? All right. We're going to start our story off in John. Well, we're going to go back a few chapters to John chapter 13. This is the story of the Last Supper. John chapter 13, and Jesus has said, already said a few things here about uh, how we're supposed to love um, anybody that receives me. Verse 20, truly I say to you, anyone who receives me, um, he who receives me, he also receives him who sent me, right? Verse 21, Jesus, after Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and, said, and testified and said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss of who to know which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Anybody know who that was? John, good, good, we're all awake. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us of whom it is he's speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, now what does that tell you about John's proximity to Jesus? He's right next to him. He said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus then answered, it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. What does that tell you about the proximity of Judas? He was also right next to him. As they're reclining on the table, you would have reclined on your left elbow, eat with your right hand. If John leaned back against him and talked to him, John would have been on his right. Judas would have been on his left. Most likely, who was the person served at the foot washing? Most likely, Judas. What about Peter? Where's he sitting? If he's gesturing to John, most likely, if John is sitting in the, uh, John and Judas are sitting in the most honored spots, Peter would have been in the third most honored spot, which is directly across from Jesus is what a lot of the scholars believe. Peter, Judas, and John. It's not a, a trio that you hear mentioned a lot, right? Usually we say Peter, James, and John. Peter, Judas, and John. But these three, they're all evangelists. They've all been asked by Jesus to preach the gospel. They've all went and preached the gospel. They shared something interesting that night. There were only three disciples to share one event. Does anybody know what it is? All the other disciples were there at the Last Supper. They were only three disciples 
to witness the trial of Jesus. All from three different perspectives. And as these are three evangelists, all in the right church, all preaching the right gospel, kind of want to look at the three different ministries that they had, and it shows us an example of the ministries that we have in the church and how they're going. But we're going to take a look at them one by one. But Peter, Peter is my favorite. Peter is a guy that always says the wrong thing at the wrong time. My wife can attest, sometimes I open my mouth to change feet. I am always just, I, I don't know, I, I try to have a filter. I work on having a filter, but it seems like things just sometimes come out, right? But I love God, and Peter loved God. Peter loved Jesus. He always said the wrong things. He always did the wrong things, it seems like. But Jesus looks at his love for him and brings him close into his circle. One of the closest three, Peter, James, and John, right? But Peter had a big problem, even bigger than opening his mouth at the wrong time. Let's look at the end of chapter 13, John chapter 13. Jesus is talking about, you know, how we should love each other. And uh, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. And verse 35, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And before that, he had talked about how he is going to die. And 36, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me, but you will follow after. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered and said, will you lay down your life for me? I tell you truly, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Now, for those of us that live on a farm... How many mornings do roosters skip crowing? They take Sundays off? No, they're up every morning before the sun is up. It's already evening. So that means less than eight hours from this statement, Peter is going to deny his Lord three times. What's missing? You go straight into... Verse uh, chapter 14, verse 1, we all know those verses, right? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. What's missing? Jesus, uh, Peter has been serving Jesus for years now. He should know if Jesus says something, it's going to happen. So if Peter knows Jesus this well, he should have said, Lord, what do I need to do to make sure that doesn't happen? There is no admission here. There is nothing to say. Peter said, wow, I don't want to be there. Lord, please help me. So Peter loved Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus everywhere. But his biggest problem was that he wanted to follow him in his own power. He thought he was big enough to follow Jesus to death. And he was pretty big. When they came to arrest Jesus, he whips out a sword. I love this. You know, the Marine in me says, yeah. Yeah, I joined the Marines because I said freedom is a wonderful thing and we don't deserve it unless we are willing to fight and protect for the freedoms of others. I've since changed my stance on that a little bit as a follower of Jesus, I said, I say, we still need to sacrifice for others. I'm not sure that we need to pick up a weapon to defend them. But I have this heart that I can identify with Peter. When he whips out that sword, I'm like, yes, let's go fight these guys. He followed him all the way into the trial.
But when he was surrounded by people that hated Jesus and hated everything that Jesus stood for, his own strength was gone. He gets started to ask questions. Hey, you're with that Jesus guy, right? No, no, never heard of him. I know you're with that Jesus. I've seen you with him. You must be mistaking me for somebody else. And then a couple of gospels say that when he was asked the third time, he cursed and swore. They said, we know you're with him because you talk like him. And he cursed and swore to show that there was no way that he could be associated with Jesus. Luke says that when he did that, Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine how he felt? He had just denied the person that he said he would die for. He has just denied him three times. Jesus said he, would gonna, he was going to do it. And Jesus just looks at him. Do you think it was a scolding look? Do you think it was a harsh look? Just, I know what you did. I love you. And brokenhearted, Peter runs out of there. He runs through the street crying all night. He runs through the street praying for forgiveness all night. So I love Peter. But he needed that breaking moment because he was trying to follow God in his own strength and he needed to know there is no way to get to heaven on our own strength. We all need Jesus. In order to get through this life, we have to give up ourselves and rely completely on Jesus. And when Peter learned that, he became the biggest gospel preacher that we see in the Bible. Okay, Paul wrote a lot of books. Jesus did, you know, all these miracles. But Jesus, a lot of the time, he spent training the 12. When Peter went out, you know, Jesus had somebody touch the hem of his garment, and they were healed. When Peter walked by, they tried to line up the streets so that his shadow would pass them, and they would be healed. Can you imagine that? He got up and preached, and 3,000 people were converted. This is the thing that I love the most. Let's go back to uh, John chapter 21. See, Peter decided, you know, maybe I'm not worthy to be an evangelist anymore. I've denied Jesus. So he says, I'm going to go fishing. That's the trade that he came from. He says, I'm going back to fishing. I love that the church didn't just let him go. They said, all right, we're going to go fishing with you. <laughs> and uh, Jesus shows up. He's on the bank. And they go see him. We skip down. Peter had denied Jesus three times. So verse 15, chapter 21 of John, says, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? By the way, there's three words in Greek for love. Do you know what they are? Gape, phileo, eros. It's where we get the erotic. It doesn't mean that, but it means something that you desire only as long as it's desirable, right? Phileo is brotherly love, like what we have for a family member. Agape is a, a love that has no bounds, if you will. So when Jesus asked the first time, he says, do you agape love me? And Peter says, you know I love you, phileo. You know, Lord, I love you as a brother. I don't have that agape love for you yet. Jesus saw that he did. Peter couldn't see it. So Jesus, the next question he asks him on, on Peter's level, he says, tend my lambs. Then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? He meets him where, Jesus always meets us where we are, right? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. 
He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. I love Peter because it shows that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what mistakes you've made in life. Jesus longs to take you from that spot and move you to someplace so much better. Peter becomes, became such a follower of Jesus that when he died, they went to crucify him. And he said, wait a minute, I don't deserve to die like Jesus. Instead of denying who Jesus was, he says, crucify me upside down. That's the love that he had for Jesus. I love the ministry of Peter. Now let's move on to Judas. Now Judas is an interesting character. Um, let's go back to Matthew chapter 8. That's the first glimpse that we have of Judas. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19. It says, Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That's pretty close to what Peter said, right? And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. Many scholars and the desire of ages attribute this statement to Judas. Judas wanted to push his way into the discipleship. He says, that's a man that knows where he's going, and I want to be part of it. And he was fit for the, fit, fit for the task. He was a scribe. He was well-educated. On all accounts, he looked like he would be the biggest apostle. A lot of people think that maybe Paul was the one that really uh, replaced him. And you think of all the things that Paul did. Why would we study about Judas? You know, it was the story of Judas that made me decide to first become a Christian. It was the story of how Jesus reached out to Judas that broke my heart and showed me what God is really like. Judas was very capable. He was very smart. He was, he was a great preacher, I would imagine. But he had a big problem. I'm reminded of another person in history. I love history. I love telling stories. Um, I hope I don't, don't bore you with stories. There's a statue of a boot in, uh, um, close to the Battle of the Saratoga, one of the battles of the Revolution. They didn't want to make a statue of the entire person. This is a boot, it says, to honor the most brilliant officer in the Continental Army of the Revolution. This man was so brilliant that he made his, vict or his defeats look like victories. He was so brilliant that he was raised to the rank of a major general by George Washington. He was one of George Washington's right-hand men. And it was his galley, uh, uh, um, his... Um, courage. During the battle of uh, the second battle of Saratoga, he defied orders and rode into battle, and the men uh, gathered around him, and they won this battle that looked like they were going to lose. So you could say that his actions won the second battle of Saratoga. Now, why that's important is, if it wasn't for winning that battle, probably the French would have never helped us with the revolution. So you could say that without him, there would be no United States of America. But he was wounded so severely in that battle that one leg became two inches shorter than the other. And he was only given a post of West Point. And becoming embittered, he decided to give away West Point to the British and convert over to the British side. And then he started leading troops, British troops, against the Americans. When he had captured one of the Americans, he said, what do you think they'll do if, if the Americans ever capture me? 
And he said, well, we'll probably cut off the leg that was wounded, bury it in military honors, and hang the rest of you. His name, Benedict Arnold, has become a byword. Judas, Benedict Arnold, these are traitors. These are great men that could have done amazing things, but because of their own greed, their own thirst for power, their whole mission fell apart. Where we see Judas fall apart, and, and we don't have time probably to go in depth into it, he was already uh, taking care of the money for the poor. There was a banquet at Simon's house where somebody poured oil, expensive oil, over the feet of Jesus. And John says that it was Judas that spoke up and said, why was this money not given to the poor? Now, he said that because he was a thief, not because he loved the poor, according to John. It says right after that in Matthew that Judas left and asked how much money they would give him to betray the man he previously said he would go to the ends of the earth to follow. What went wrong? When you look at when you look at Judas before when, when he goes into the trial of Jesus, He gets convicted, it says, right when Jesus becomes condemned. He saw what he had done. He saw that he had betrayed somebody that was God. He saw his guilt, but he didn't repent. I love what Matthew says. Do you remember what Judas said, or what Jesus said when Judas came to uh, betray Jesus? He goes up and he kisses him. He says, Hail, Rabbi! Of course, he's showing up with an army with clubs and swords. I mean, it's like, like nobody's going to notice the army behind him, right? But he goes up like he's his best friend. Hail, Rabbi. And the first word that Matthew says Jesus spoke was friend. He said, friend, do what you came for. You see, over time in the ministry, Judas saw things that Jesus did, and he said, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done it a much different way. And over time, he starts to think that he is more intelligent than Jesus. That he would have done a better ministry than Jesus. Some, some um, Desire of Ages says that he was trying to force Jesus to become the king. That's why he betrayed him. And over time, Jesus became his enemy. But I love this, and this is why I love studying the story of Judas. Judas is the first feet, most likely, that Jesus washed. Judas is sitting right beside Jesus. Jesus let him sit right beside him. He gives him the money for the poor because he wants him to have a heart to reach out for the poor. Jesus over and over again reaches out to Jesus, Judas. Even as he's arrested, he calls him friend. You see, Jesus became Judas' friend, but Judas never became Je or Jesus became Judas' enemy, but Judas never became Jesus' enemy. And that's what I love about God. So we can say that Judas' ministry fell apart because Judas refused to repent. He refused to accept 
that he needed Jesus. Plain and simple. It breaks my heart, but I love the picture of God that it shows. The last one, John. I love John. I'm definitely not like a John. My grandfather, um, I've never seen him do anything that he knew to be wrong. He was the saint of a man. Any spare time that he had, he would read Ellen White or the Bible. He was just engrossed in learning about God, getting close to God. And that's what I think about when I think of John. I know he's one of the sons of thunders. He had some issues to work through, but he was also right next to Jesus. And not because he had some jealousy issues. He is the disciple that Jesus loved. Why is that? It's not because he had some power trip that he had to get close to Jesus. It was because John wanted to be closest to Jesus. My dad asked my grandfather one time, he said, have you ever done anything that you know to be wrong? And he said, yes, when I was 10, my mom told me not to go to a movie and I snuck out and watched the movie anyway. Can you imagine that? When he was 10, he had to think back to when he was 10. John loved Jesus so much, he ran away at first. But when Jesus went into the trial, he said, can I go and watch? And he watched. He watched as Jesus was falsely accused. And he sat there and watched as Jesus was beaten. He sat there and watched as crowns were placed, a crown of thorns was placed on Jesus' head and it was beat down on him and people were kicking him and spitting on him, yelling at him, mocking him. John watched all of that. When you read 1 John, it has the word love in it more than any other book of the Bible. It only has five chapters. If you want to see a picture of the love of God, read the books of John. And John got so close to Jesus. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, and John is not understanding what's going on, but he can't leave Jesus. Jesus looks down and he sees him, and he sees his mom, and he says, John, there's your mom. Mom, there's your son. Can you imagine being so close to Jesus that he entrusts you? with the life of his mother. Peter was a great apostle. Peter was a great preacher. Peter was a great healer and miracle worker. and He was just on fire for God. But John, he was the one that got closest to Jesus. When it came to the end of his life, they couldn't kill him. They tried. They put him in boiling oil, and this guy just wouldn't die. But when it came to his end of his life, John sees and vision the revelation of the entire history of the Christian church. It was to John that Jesus entrusted the oracles of prophecy. But what does this all mean? Where is your mission? Let's go back to John chapter 21. After Jesus has just told, uh, you know, gone through the three times of I love, uh, you know, do you love me? Verse 18, chapter John 21, 18. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, this is te- speaking to Peter, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to a place where you do not want to go. Crucifixion. Now, he said this signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, 
Always opening his mouth, right? Saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had also been leaning on his uh, bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is it that betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? What kind of death is he going to have? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain, remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Where is your ministry? It boils down to this. Who are you following? It doesn't matter if you've made mistakes. It doesn't matter if you open your mouth at the wrong time. Who are you following? It doesn't matter if you have never made a mistake. Who are you following? Judas could have looked like Peter or John. Judas made a huge mistake. But if he would have repented, do you think Jesus would have taken him back? Judas looked like John, that everything had gone right in his life. He had done all the right things. He had said all the right things. But who was he following? His own desires. Seven-word summaries. I had a professor that loved seven-word summaries. He said they stick with you better. If you have made mistakes, follow Jesus. If you don't want to be a traitor... Follow Jesus. To be close to Jesus, follow Jesus. Don't worry about others. You follow Jesus.